All right, it's time for lecture number nine. Today, we'll discuss Congress. There are a few things that you should be able to do at the end of this presentation. You should be able to compare and contrast the House and Senate in terms of the qualifications for serving in each of those chambers, their constitutional powers, the leadership in each of those, uh, how they're organized. And then you want to be able to evaluate of these two, which do you believe to be the most powerful? Congress works in the building shown in the upper left, the United States Capitol. I have to say it's one of the most amazing places I have ever been in the United States. If you've never toured the Capitol, I strongly encourage you to do so. I was lucky enough to do so a couple times and you can see a photo of me and my wife at the bottom of the screen. The first topic we'll explore will be qualifications for serving in both the House and the Senate. The Constitution identifies several qualifications and what we'll do is we'll fill in this chart as we go along. The Constitution identifies a minimum age for serving in both chambers. It's 25 years old for the House and 30 for the Senate. One must also be a citizen to be a member of the House or the Senate. For the House, it's at least seven years, and for the Senate, it's at least nine years. Now, I'd like to point something out. You don't have to be a citizen from birth in order to serve in the House or the Senate. In the upper left-hand corner here, you see a photo of Pete Hoekstra. He was the congressman from West Michigan. Um, he was my congressman for many years. He was actually born in the Netherlands, and he became an American citizen over the years, and he eventually served for 18 years in the House of Representatives. In the upper right, you see Jennifer Granholm. Now, she was the governor of Michigan, but she was born in Vancouver, B.C., in Canada. And then, of course, the bottom right, we see the governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was born in Austria, but he became an American citizen, and he served as governor of California. There's also a residency requirement outlined by the Constitution. It's actually the same for the House and the Senate. However, based upon tradition in the House of Representatives, those reps generally live in the district that they are representing, but it's not required by the Constitution. I've shown this map a couple of times. Um, West Shore Community College is located in Michigan's second congressional district. Okay? It's not required that a representative live in his or her district, uh, but usually they know the strengths, the weaknesses, they know the people there, and so uh, uh, based upon tradition, um, usually people live in those districts that they're representing. The Constitution also requires that the number of House members is based upon each state's population. Every state gets at least one, but today, um, and then others are added based upon uh, the number of people who live there. And today it's one for about every 700,000 people. For the Senate, there are two senators per state. Here are some additional criteria. The Constitution requires that House members have a term length of two years. It's six years for the Senate. While the total number of House members is not set by the Constitution, for the last hundred years or so, the total number of members of the House of Representatives has been 435. And with two senators from every state and with 50 states, today we have 100 senators. Next, I'd like to explore the constitutional powers of the House and the Senate. The Constitution gives special powers to each chamber. In many ways, the House of Representatives has the authority to initiate several things. First of all, the House of Representatives initiates all tax bills. Every single time there's a tax increase or tax cut, it must start, that bill must start in the House. Based upon tradition, all spending bills are initiated 
in the house, whether it's on defense, education, whatever it may be. And then also just as a little review, the House of Representatives initiates the removal process because the House has the sole power of impeachment. The Senate also has special powers and authority. In many ways, the Senate has the final say on several things. For example, the Senate has the authority to either approve or to reject major nominations made by the president, whether it's his advisors or uh, maybe um, members of the judiciary, something like that. The Senate also has the authority to either ratify or to reject a treaty, and treaties are negotiated by the president. Finally, the Senate has the final say when it comes to removing someone who's been impeached, because if someone's been impeached, the Senate then acts as a jury in the removal trial. Next, we'll explore leadership in Congress. However, before we do that, uh, we'll explore a key concept that shapes leadership and how Congress operates. The key concept that really shapes how the House and the Senate operate would be this idea of the majority party. The party in the majority, the party that has more members, has a tremendous amount of influence over anything that gets passed. Not just because they have more members, but they get to choose people to serve in the most powerful positions. So, right now, in the House and the Senate, well, we've got the Democratic Party that is in the majority in the House, the Republican Party is in the majority in the Senate. In the White House, well, Donald Trump is a Republican. That means that right now, today, we have what's called divided government. So let's explore some of those leadership positions and some of the leaders themselves. We will begin with the House of Representatives. The top leadership position, the most powerful person in the House, is the Speaker of the House. There are a few traits to consider when exploring the Speaker of the House. First of all, a person gets to be the Speaker by a vote for, of all of the House members. It's always a member of the majority party, and they get together and they vote for their leader, and so um, that's how you get to be the Speaker of the House, by a vote of the members of your party. Next, the Speaker has a lot of authority over debate and the calendar. The Speaker can actually determine which bills come up for discussion and debate to begin with. Now, while this is an awful lot of power and authority that the Speaker has, based upon tradition, the Speaker does allow opposing bills to be introduced. And the Speaker also um, often doesn't vote in uh, a symbolic gesture demonstrating the nonpartisan nature of the Speaker position. Here is the door to the Speaker's office. It's actually located right in the middle of the Capitol, uh, right off of the Capitol Rotunda. I had hoped to view uh, the Speaker's office, but it was closed that day. So I guess I have another excuse to get to Washington, D.C. and do the tour. Now, you will not be tested on who holds these positions, but it's, sometimes it's interesting to learn about the people who are in these powerful positions. Right now, the Speaker of the House is Nancy Pelosi. She is the highest ranking woman ever in the United States government. Uh, she comes from a political family. Her dad was a politician, uh, and she was first elected in 1987. She's from California. So the Speaker is the top position in the House of Representatives. The second most powerful position would be Majority Leader. Here's a one-sentence definition of what the Majority Leader does. It's leader of the Majority Party and in charge of its agenda. Essentially, because the Speaker is supposed to be nonpartisan, the Majority Leader establishes the goals or top priorities, whether, hey, we're going to go for a tax cut or maybe a tax increase on certain Americans, or maybe um, we're going to push for education reform or whatever it may be. That's the job of the Majority Leader. The current House Majority Leader is shown here, Steny Hoyer. He's been involved in politics since the 1980s. And in the past, he supported the Americans with Disabilities Act. And in recent years, he's been a strong proponent of a national health care plan. As one might guess, after the majority leader comes, the minority leader. 
Well, the minority leader does the same thing as the majority leader, just for the other party. So leader of the minority party and in charge of its agenda. The minority leader tries to establish top, top priorities. So if the Democrats are going to try to push for a tax increase on the wealthiest Americans or something along those lines, well, the minority leader would try to say, okay, um, these are the arguments against that or whatever the, pro the party proposes as its top goals. Here we see the current minority leader. He's from California. It's Kevin McCarthy. Just a little bit of trivia about him. Uh, he owned his own business when he was kind of young, and the, re the way that he got his seed money, money for it was kind of unique. He won the lottery. Now, I think it was only for about $10,000 or something like that, but uh, just something kind of interesting about Kevin McCarthy. The next position would be the whips. Now here we see the current majority whip, uh, James Clyburn. He actually has an interesting background. He met his wife in a unique place, jail. Uh, both of them grew up in the segregated South and both were protesting nonviolently against segregation. Both were thrown in jail and that's where they met. He's come a long way. There are two primary things that whips do. First of all, they count votes. They try to determine if a proposal will pass or not, if it will have enough votes. Secondly, they tr if, if it's on the edge, they try to build support and groups of support for bills um, in order to try to get them passed. Essentially, they try to get members of their party to vote in favor of legislation that leadership supports. Uh, and so often it's their job to say, okay, if you're on the fence on this topic, if you're not sure if you're going to vote for it, what will it take to get your vote? Maybe a proposal needs to be modified a little bit. Uh, and it's the job of the whip to try to get those people on the fence to vote in favor of a, of a particular proposal. Both parties have whips. Clyburn is the current Democratic whip. Well, here we see Steve Scalise. He is the Republican whip in the House of Representatives. He's from Louisiana, has a background in computer science. He also has a unique uh, history. Um, a couple of years ago, he was actually shot when the Republican Party was getting ready for kind of a fun um, baseball game uh, to, to play against the Democrats. A sniper shot him. He's had several uh, uh, operations, but he's back in Congress. He's doing well. Uh, and so that was just, oh, it was awful uh, when, it, when it happened a couple of years ago. I think it's good to offer just a bit of a profile of our United States representatives. If you live in the northern part of the college district, uh, Jack Bergman is your congressman. He has a bachelor's and master's degree, and he was in the Marine Corps for 40 years. He retired as a lieutenant general. Jack Bergman has one of the largest congressional districts in the entire country. It includes all of the UP, all of northern Michigan, including all of Manistee County and the northern half of Mason County. If you live in Mason County, your representative is probably Bill Heisinger. He was involved in real estate, had a family business. He also was an aide to our previous congressman, um, and he's been in office since 2010. The area in the rectangle here, uh, in the light blue color, well, that demonstrates all of the counties included in Bill Heisinger's second congressional district. Bill Heisinger has come to the college. He has spoken with students, and this is from a visit to the college from a few years ago. Well, we've addressed the leadership in the House of Representatives. Let's explore the Senate next. The Constitution identifies a few leadership positions in the Senate. The first would be the President of the Senate. Do you know who the current President of the Senate is? His image is shown here. His name is Mike Pence. He's got another job as well. He's also the Vice President of the United States. The President of the Senate is always the Vice President of the United States. Uh, by the way, the only time the Vice President votes as a Senator is to break a tie. 
So the president of the Senate is the vice president of the United States. Because the vice president can't always be there, there's another position identified in the Constitution. That's called the president pro tempore of the Senate. The position occupying this office uh, has a qualification based upon tradition. It's a member of the majority party who's been in the Senate the longest. Here we see the current president pro tem of the Senate, Chuck Grassley. He grew up on a farm, went to college, and has a bachelor's and master's degree in political science. He and his wife married in 1954, so that means their marriage has lasted well over 60 years. The Constitution identifies those positions of President of the Senate and President Pro Tempore. Well, the way things have actually evolved is that those positions are largely symbolic. There's not a whole lot of power that comes with it. The most powerful position in the U.S. Senate is the Office of Majority Leader. Now, I talked about the majority and minority leader in the House. In the Senate, they do the same thing. Essentially, the majority leader and minority leader are the leader of their party in that chamber and in charge of their party's agenda, their goals, the types of legislation that they want to support. Here we see the current Senate majority leader, the most powerful person in the Senate. His name is Mitch McConnell. He comes from Kentucky. And one thing that's kind of interesting about him is that as a boy, he had polio, so he suffered from polio uh, in his childhood, and he actually had to learn how to walk again. One other little piece of trivia with him, uh, Senator McConnell's the majority leader. Well, his wife is also involved in politics. She is the current Secretary of Transportation for President Trump. In the past, she was in President Bush's cabinet, and she's been involved in politics and a range of different offices in the past. After the majority leader comes the minority leader. Chuck Schumer, shown here, is the current Senate minority leader. His dad was an exterminator and his mom was a homemaker. Just one other dumb piece of trivia, I guess. His second cousin, well, you might be familiar with her. It's Amy Schumer, the actress. Yeah, I know. After not the minority important. leader would come just that whips, but there aren't any crucial whips in the Senate, so I'm not going to identify anyone there. Um, but I did want to identify uh, the unique role of rookie senators. Rookie senators play a unique role in the United States Senate. Um, often, they serve as chair for debate. See, debate can go on and on and on in the United States Senate. So, they get the job that nobody else wants. They serve as chair. They have to be there. It also leads to one of the unique events in American history. In 1963, the rookie senator from Massachusetts was chairing debate. And then he received a note, and he called debate to a halt. And he said, the president's just been shot. We need to adjourn. Well, this was November of 1963. The president who had just been shot was John Kennedy. That rookie senator from Massachusetts, well... It was Ted Kennedy. So it's one of the ironies of American history and tradition that Ted Kennedy actually had to announce on the floor of the U.S. Senate that his own brother, the president, had been shot. Michigan's senior senator is shown here. She grew up in the Lansing area, then she got a degree in social work, and then became involved in politics. She was first elected in the year 2000. A few years back, Senator Stabenow visited West Shore. Michigan's other senator is Gary Peters. He's got several degrees, one from Alma, another from Wayne State, and one from Michigan State University in philosophy. He was in the Naval Reserve for several years and first elected in 2014. Senator Peters came to Ludington a few years back as well. Well, we're just about done, but I'd like to review some of the main ideas from today's presentation. This lecture focused on a comparison and contrast between the House and the Senate in terms of qualifications for serving, 
constitutional powers, leadership position and how they're organized, what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to evaluate which of these chambers you believe to be the most powerful and most important. Well, that's all for today. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon online.